are counting started. Uh, good afternoon and welcome to Technology and Teaching. This is uh, California State University Chico with our chill, second tilt session. And um, I'm very fortunate today to have Dr. Kim Jackson here with me from the Department of English. And she's going to talk to us today about managing small groups. She's got some really innovative strategies for um, creating working groups that seem to last a full semester. Yes. And, yes. Are, and are pretty good. So um, I'm glad you're tuning in today. And I'm going to move over to Kim's presentation. And here we go. So Great. take it away, Kim. Thanks so much, Anne. So welcome to this tilt session on designing productive stu student groups. Um, I'm going to offer a range of practices, everything from theory to some actual structures to even just some details, some classroom management details that you can work with. Um, but I'm actually going to start with learning theory just for a moment before moving into some of these actual lesson plans or practices that you can use. My, my assumption would be that um, using student groups isn't new. <laughs> People have been having students work in groups for a long time. But I hear my colleagues complaining sometimes about um, how productive those are. And I also often hear people say that they put students in groups because they want them to work well together as a team or because they want them to learn to be social. And while those ideas resonate with me, they're not exactly why I use student groups. Um, the reason that I use student groups is because of the way I think about learning and the way I think about knowledge. So I'm going to talk about that for just a moment. Um, so most of the teaching that I do is really supported by learning theory that comes out of uh, Vygotskyan and Neo-Vygotskyan ways of thinking about learning. And so what it's kind of pushing against, just to give you this brief overview, is most of our teaching imagines that learning is in individual heads. The knowledge is up here in your head. And so you have to take tests because you're trying to quiz what's, what's here. Learning, people that think about learning as social and as participation, think of learning as happening actually among the activities, the dialogue, the structures, the people that you're in the room with, and that it's very, very, very context dependent. So that what you know really depends on what resources you have access to, the kinds of conversations that you can have. Um, so it would be one of the reasons why I might encourage in a classroom students to actually talk with each other and try to create meaning as opposed to like finding the answer. That's not to say that there aren't experts or answers out there, but I think of those as more of a resource and you're helping students leverage those resources as a way to create new meaning and new understanding for themselves. Um, these are just two of the texts that, um, if you were interested at all, these are not texts that are going to help you figure out how to work with groups. These are texts that are going to help you to think about learning in a different way. Um, Jean Lave and A.T. Wang are by far in the 90s kind of set the tone for thinking about learning as participation. So that's one of the reasons I put these titles up here for you. And then just as one final brief thing to kind of explain this notion of having these permanent working teams, um, Ed Hutchins kind of followed up on their research with a, a piece called Cognition in the Wild. And he thinks about learning as distributed cognition. So he says here, knowledge and cognition is distributed across objects, individuals, artifacts, and tools in the environment. So what I know is, is just as much a part of what's in front of me, like the computer or the space. So an example would be like math. What I know about math really depends on whether I have a calculator or not. I actually don't know a lot about math unless I have a calculator in front of me. So the, the idea that knowledge is, is a part of the tools that you use and a part of the dialogue that you have with people. So when I ask students to work together in groups, I'm asking them, to use each other to generate new meaning and new understanding and to dialogue as a way to create learning. So I don't do tests. I do, I have a lot of other ways to assess them and think about um, making them productive. So that's just a little background on, it's not just about working well together. It's actually much more complicated than that for, for why I put students in groups. So I'm gonna turn to some of my, the practices that I think have been fairly productive um, for getting a pretty high level of work from these groups that can sometimes not be very much fun for students. I mean, a lot of them really complain, right, about being forced to work with groups. And I have less of that in my class, and I think there's some, some of these structures are why. So one of the things, um, I'm going to highlight some of these in this talk, and, and one of the things that we do is 
we create permanent teams from day one, and they're random. I just let Vista, Blackboard CT, Web CT Vista, um, randomly assign these groups for me. And they meet each other on the first day of class and know that they're going to work together the whole semester. And I think over time they build community. So whether they were working in class or projects outside of class or giving peer response or whatever it is, since mostly I teach writing, um, these are the people. These are their buddies. These are their partners. And their people turn out to be roommates. And, like, they get to know each other really well. The way we set it up the very first day, and I'm going to talk about two things, this creation of norms and then ways that we build community through social media and other kinds of technologies that we leverage. So if I, I want to just show you really specifically um, some of these ways that we create group norms, and I'm going to take you through what I ask students to do in class. So one of the first things they do is they do this quick write for me, an in-class writing prompt, where they, they answer this question. Reflect on a time you were a member of a group. Did the group work well together? What allowed that to happen? Did the group work poorly? What got in the way? Focus specifically on the conditions that supported or prevented full participation. So I ask my students to think about sports teams they've been involved with, work environments, classroom spaces, and to really grab something specific and think about whether it worked or not and then why. So one of the first things that will come up when you're throwing this out there for a group of students is they'll think, well, one of the things that, that can make a group not productive is if people don't show up, that would be one, or if they don't show up having done the reading. And so I have them write about this as a way to go into their negotiation over what norms really matter to them, what things do they want to make sure they hold each other accountable to. So they start by doing this writing, and then they get into these permanent groups they're about to get to be their best friends with, and I start by just telling them to introduce themselves and talk about where they live and just get to know each other. And then they start to share ideas from that prompt. And it's interesting to listen to them in the room because, you know, they start with all these war stories of why they hate groups. And out of that comes some practices that they can then draw on and, and make the group a little more productive. So they turn at some, and after about 15 or 20 minutes towards creating these norms. And someone's described, they're going to agree to type them up and live by them. And ultimately what they're creating are conditions under which someone can get kicked out of the group. And that's what I tell them. These are things you're going to agree to so that if you don't do them, the group can say, you know, we said we weren't going to miss the reading more than twice and you haven't read the last four weeks and so you're out. And when I teach a jumbo with 100 students, in any given semester I will have one or two students who get kicked out of their group. And it sucks, and they, they um, have to work by themselves or find someone who will work with them. They're usually having a hard time anyway because they haven't been to class. But I know it's what makes the groups feel like they have some control over this. And it, I think it's one of the things that kind of raises their level because they care more about what each other thinks even than I think. Yes, Laura. Uh, is it okay to ask questions? Absolutely. Um, yeah. Each group that you create from the beginning then create these norms by yep. which they're going to live. Is each group have their own different norms from their, another group? They have their own set. share them with the rest of the group? They post them on Vista so the other groups can see what the other norms are, but they have their own that they live by. And, in fact, I'll show you some examples even in a minute of the kinds of things, because they're also funny. You know, some of the things they come up with are funny. Um, but mostly they are things like often I'll have an attendance policy and they'll undercut it with a shorter attendance policy, for example. Maybe I have five and they'll say three. Um, and then they, ha they live by that, so they, they, you know, making sure. But it, if they have a group who, and this is what you have to kind of trust as an instructor, if you have a group that wants to agree that it's all loosey-goosey, which, I, by the way, I've never had happen. They usually, they care about their learning, ultimately. Um, I, I, they can make it so it's two norms. You know, we're going to check Vista by midnight before class and try to show up. I mean, they can be fairly loose. It's what, whatever they agree on. And then finally, they, they post these norms to the discussion area and, vet and their preferred addresses and text messages and, and all those so that they can find each other easily or text each other easily. Um, and I actually think I'm going to show you um, a little bit of them working to create these norms in this YouTube uh, video that I uploaded with students from one of my classes. So let's see. If I go back over here and I open this up, there it is. You know, run it. Um, actually, what you're seeing here before before we start it, and you can hear it. Um, yes, okay. 
Okay, got it. Ready? Okay. So now um, we're seeing it, I'm assuming. And so one of the things I want to notice, be you notice before you play it, and it seems like an insignificant thing, but it's actually a really big deal, and that is I tell them you have to look like a group to act like a group. And I will physically grab their <laughs> chairs and move them so that they are sitting so that they're facing each other. Because all this research shows if you have this guy, here's Chase, who I adore, if he's sitting over here, he, he just won't be a part of the work. And, and I say that to them. They get used to that mantra, hey, look like a group, act like a group. And they tighten in their circles and tighten in their circles. So I just wanted this isn't insignificant. So you should know this group is really trying to negotiate norms, but I had them do it um, outside of class for the audio recording, which is why you don't see all 100 in here, um, because it was just too hard to pick up in a class of 100. So they're actually negotiating here, um, but did it for me uh, on their own, and we recorded. So. Okay. Or maybe they, like, I don't know, if it's going to be me. Do a quick discussion on them. So can we like talk about that like even weekly? Yeah. Like it'll be one of our norms, like when we meet together, we'll talk about the meeting for the next week. Yeah. And uh, I think it's always good to exchange the like, contact information with people in the group, like email addresses and tell them build a community and build a community exactly how to So how about that's our first norm to post our contact information? Yeah, I think it's very very real contact information. <laughs> no views. <laughs> so I don't know if you can hear that, but Chase says, um, I'm going to go back to my slides. Is that okay? Back to when the classroom? Yeah. Hey, look like, it's like magic. Um, I don't know if you could hear what Chase said, but he said real contact information. I, I show that, and I only showed a short clip because it's not super exciting. It's not, you know, like, woo, group norm nirvana or anything going on, but they really will take it very seriously. And, and, ultimately negotiate together. No, I won't do that. This group actually agreed that they're going to meet a half hour before class to talk about the readings, because the readings that we're doing are really hard, and we'll see how long that lasts. It was something that they actually all agreed to. Um, so I want to show you some examples. These are real norms that students came up with this semester. Um, and then the two things that you'll find that your students are the most concerned about are having a slacker, someone who isn't going to pull their load, but they're just as scared and have had situations of having someone who takes over the group and run, tries to run it. So often their norms you'll see um, talk like no authoritarians. <laughs> we don't want anybody taking over. Um, and share with us if you're starting to struggle. They, they realized right away that um, we do so much work online and in VISTA that they needed some norms around checking VISTA because they don't want to be the one out of the loop. We didn't know that we were reading something or whatever. And then, as I said, some of them end up being funny. So like this group has... Um, if you bring gum, you have to bring a piece of gum for everyone. It's part of their norm. <laughs> and I've seen students have norms around um, if you miss, you have to bring cookies the next time or whatever. And they, I think this is, you know, also a part of the way that they're building community and they're, and they're also just very funny. So these norms, and I'll talk about the folder later. You aren't going to totally be able to see this on camera, but um, I'm going to talk about this folder as a way that I managed all these groups when I have a huge jumbo class. But these norms get typed up not only on Vista but in this folder and they have attendance stuff and their contact info so that when they're in class, I've seen them, they point, they point to it and say, hey, we said we're going to do, you know, in our kindest voice possible that we do this, and you're not doing that. So, um, so I'm going to show you, besides this creating norms, and I think this is a big part of the structure of our groups, we have a bunch of other ways that we build community over the course of the semester that's both inside the classroom and outside the classroom. And I think this also really contributes to the fact that they become a very tight-knit group of people who are also good friends. And when you're friends, all of a sudden you care about performing for these people. So we have a lot of technology that we use, and I'm going to show you some of them. Um, right now I use four really main technologies, and that's um, Vista, a wiki space, and I'll show you in a minute, Ning and Twitter. Um, Vista for me really functions as the official class space. It's where the syllabus and the calendar and posting assignments. But these groups actually have their own specific section in Vista where they can post notes to each other. When they post their writing in a big class of 100, only those five people see it. So it's a little bit of a safe haven in the middle of this big giant apparatus that we have. I use, and I'll show, you, I'll show it to you here, I use a wiki space as a way for the groups to build community um, around research. So we created this wiki 
we have to do you have to do you think? Do you want to see it? Yes, yeah. please. <laughs> Thanks, Jackie. Right. There you go. Yeah, thanks. Um, if I click to another link, do you still have to app share it? Nope. Okay, it'll great. Go. It'll go because I'm just going to show one more. So that's great. Awesome. So this, so this is our class Wikispace, um, which anybody can create at wikispaces.com, and I can my email address is at the end. You can always ask me for these uh, references. But these groups have created um, their own pages based around particular kinds of research that we're doing right now in our class. And they work really hard to create a database together that they can all share and use. So they post links and summaries and give each other suggestions for how they could use these articles as part of their research. And they quickly come to rely on each other so that, back to this whole idea of distributed cognition, really. So what they might know by themselves is a tiny little bit, but when you've got 90 people working on something, or in this case, five really close people trying to find information around your research, all of a sudden, of course, you have just a ton more sources. So there's a lot of buy-in in their groups just from the fact that they're seeing um, each other supported. So that's one thing. VISTA as the kind of permanent official, this is where we post assignments, this wiki space as a way to build a research community. And then I use what's called a NING, um, N-I-N-G, as a way to build a back channel. Um, in our class, and I'll talk about what I mean by that. It's a term, I think, that came out from me being hanging out with the TLP folks this summer. Um, so our Ning is really much more of a social space, and students were getting on the Ning about a week and a half before classes actually began, and they started uploading photos of themselves. Um, I, I tell them that the only requirement is it has to be PG or at least PG-13, no, no drinking, no whatever. Um, this is still ultimately school. But what starts was they started to see who was from their hometown, and I wanted you to get a shot here of this is our big class working in all their small groups. Um, but this is a place where they talk about favorite films. This is a place where they share photos of themselves hiking in the park. This is where they meet to go get food together. And for us, in a class of 100, this is a way for us to just build that community again. And their small groups have their own space in this Ning as well, where they continue to share resources and share, you know, meeting to go get ice cream or, what, or whatever, literally whatever. Um, so it's been interesting to watch as they've taken over the blog and the pictures. Uh, and I would be the first to say that I understand that a lot of faculty do not want quite this much contact with all their students. Um, and so my suggestion would be that you can create something like a Ning and you don't have to be so central to it. It can be their space that you kind of leave alone as another way for them to contact. But what the upshot is that I think for faculty is between the wiki space, the Ning, our Twitter, and this Vista space, they, we really have a lot of access to each other. And the groups end up, um, because they get to know each other so closely in class, really use this as a way to communicate with each other as well. And I just think it makes when we all come in there and there's a hundred, it still feels very community-like. Um, yeah, question. Peter, go ahead. Do you uh, feel like you may have some students who are uh, less comfortable with these kinds of contact technologies? I mean, they may do email, fine, but getting on a name or having a Twitter or doing that yeah. sort of thing isn't comfortable for them? And are they disadvantaged within their group or is the group dynamic different because of that? It's a great question, and it's been fascinating to me. So they are not as high tech as I might have assumed that they would be coming into it. You know, I would say in this class of 100, I have about a third who were actually fairly resistant to some of the, to all the technology that I'm throwing out there. But the group is what has mediated that because a group member will say, did you see what someone said on the Twitter? Did you see the picture? All of a sudden, they, they want to be a member of that. So what's interesting is the students and their groups will, you know, persuade them to at least give it a try, even more so than me saying, come on, I need you on this, on this spot. Yeah, I think, I think this is pushing their abilities in some ways. And thinking about what the different spaces afford is kind of part of our work. You know, what does... What's the wiki space for? What's the name for? How are those different? How are those functions in school? I think the students are helping me sort that out too. But yes, I think 
I think part of my responsibility is to get them to see this in professional ways and how they might use it more productively, even if to reject it later, even if to say, no, it's not for me. So great question. Um, in the classroom, back to, how do I get back to my slide? Sorry. Now that I'm one of, can you tell I just click? And then, and then close that for, thank you. Okay. Thanks so much. And so if I go here, look at that. So um, the last thing, and I'm not going to totally show, show you this, but um, as I explained, this Ning is kind of functioning as this less formal space where groups can build their community. Um, but we also use Twitter, and I'm not going to pull up Twitter right now, but um, I do use it. I, I ask them to at least follow the members of their, group, of their small group, which they do, and now they've pretty much the 100 follows each other. Um, and it is a balance between social and professional, their social and professional lives, and I'm, and I'm fascinated by it. So I, I don't really, I'm not sure how Twitter is functioning as well for me in terms of the group dynamic. It's very productive in class in the way we use it, but I'm not sure how it's, you know, bonding the groups because they get kind of lost in that big mass of 100 in ways that they don't on these other sites. Okay, so... So this is, you know, here's these structures of these norms and here's this way of building communities so that they have all this contact with each other and get to know each other really well so that they ultimately, our goal is for them to function productively in class. And, and I, I really kind of think about these two things when I'm having groups work in our classroom and that is that they have to be producing something and they need to be held accountable for the work. So in terms of, of production, it really runs the range in the classroom from um, just having to create notes for me based on what they're talking about and, and I respond to those notes to having to do an informal presentation at the end of class that day. But ultimately, every day in class, those groups are producing something, whether it's a post to Vista or a Twitter post or something. And I'm sure that's what keeps them focused, obviously. It's not just sit with each other and talk with your groups about ideas. Ultimately, they, there needs to be a deliverable. And that would be my suggestion to faculty are feeling that Groups are not as productive that ultimately um, you need to have them on some task that they, that's a little bit rigorous, that's a little bit above their ability, that they need their group to help them manage. Um, and for a moment, I'm going to go back to kind of how this, these folders function. And I, I realize you can't totally see this on camera. But um, they, the groups create these group notes for me. And I write on them. I read them. So in a class of 100, this is how I manage. It's, it's, it's with these 18 groups. And the 18 groups write out their notes for what they've talked about, and I read them so that I get a sense of how the room's doing, and I respond back to them. So as a way to manage all these groups, the folders, I would suggest, are a way to communicate with your students, a way to manage the paper load in these jumbos that we're kind of all moving towards, so that you can still feel like you have contact with these groups. When they turn something in, it goes in here. I hand that back to one person instead of handing back 100 pieces of paper. It's a place where they put notes to me when they're confused. Um, and it's a place where we keep attendance and all those things. So as far as like a way to kind of how do I take all these 18 groups, I have found this to be incredibly productive. And again, almost like a deliverable. If something goes in here at the end of the class session, whether it's notes or a thing they had to work on, and it helps me see where they're confused, where they're not confused. Yeah. Um, yeah. I have two questions. First of all, a lot of times people say they're going to do something and they don't. So a professor may say, I'm going to check these folders, and then maybe they do, mm -hmm. they don't. Yeah. What was the reaction when they found out you were actually writing back to them is my first question. Yeah. And secondly, how much time do you think that you take out of your life to stay connected That's to right. the folders or checking the name or, right. or this type of thing? Yes, and, and I... I I'm a re I, you know, I think about my students a lot, so I realize that my, especially in terms of all this, you know, online community stuff, that just weaves in as part of my life. They, um, so to address the feedback question, I am, they've said to me over and over again, they're always surprised at first that I write on, she wrote on our notes is what I'll hear. She wrote on our notes. What did she say on our notes? And then they get to where they really look forward to it because I often take something that they've said and also put it up for the rest of the class to see in the next, like, this was really smart what this group was talking about. So it becomes a, oh, I wanted to notice what we said, too. Um, I know that it must make them feel, I think, it makes them feel like I value their ideas because that's true. <laughs> I actually am interested in what they think. Um, I think the, this is fast. This, this checking 18 group folders and looking through their notes is 
20 minutes of my life, really, or a half hour. Skim, skim, skim. A couple good ideas, a couple things I want to use in class next time. It's not a big thing. Um, the Ming, Twitter, Wikispaces, Vista, um, means I often work late just because I like it. I wouldn't have to. I just, I like having that kind of access and connection with my students. So you could leave it alone. You could say I'm going to check it till 6 and I'm done. But um, I happen to, I probably have to, that's one of my, over in terms of sustainability, that's probably something I have to think about doing a little better job with. So um, the last thing I want to actually address here is, um, so in the, I feel like the way that some of these structures are presented that I've talked about here for like the last half hour feels like I have a lot of control. And where I'd like to, one thing I'd like to address is this, there are structures in place, there are norms, there are attendance, there are folders, there are things I ask them to do. But there's also this real element of trust. And I think that some of the things, that's some, some ways that faculty get a little stopped by groups. So, for example, there's a lot of research that's come out on groups. Thea Wolf on this campus, who's first year experience coordinator, did some research in the 80s and 90s on groups that was really helpful for me. And one of the things she discovered is that groups follow this really um, traceable routine, which is, and you, you, this will sound familiar to you probably, you get together with someone, especially students in a classroom, and the first thing they talk about is, what did you do this weekend? Or how you feeling, or oh, I'm so tired, or did you do the reading, or that reading was stupid, or whatever. They'll, they'll do this underlife thing, this, that was dumb, yeah, I don't know, I didn't know what he was talking about, he was really repetitive. If you trust in that and don't try to control it, very quickly someone in the group will say, what are we supposed to be doing? And they'll get right back on task. Like you can trust that that's just a part of them building community and building friendships is the off-task time. And that I would say it's just as productive as the on-task time. Now, if that's what they're doing the whole class, sure, will you address it? But those moments, if you think about how you function as an adult, you're not like every second of the 50 minutes totally attending. You have moments where you have a side conversation with a colleague, and there should be some tr little trust and love with students in, in that side of it. There's a little bit of letting them get off topic for a moment and just trust that if you have something they're producing, they will get back on topic and get that thing produced, get the thing solved by the end of class. So I just kind of want to open that up. If you treat them like professionals and don't try to micromanage every single moment, actually the structures of the, of the group can work. So um, I'm going to leave it open for more questions at the point, if there are any, or we can, okay. I'll ask you a question. Okay. We all know that there are a bazillion web channel applications out there. Yes. And in conversations I've had with you, I know that sometimes it's overwhelming trying to decide what tools you're going to use. So yes. Did you have any sort of guidelines that you were following, just intuitive even, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. when you picked Twitter and Ning, and we Look. know why you picked the right. LMS. Right, right. Um, and a question for you is, would you be open to maybe using a different application the next time you teach it? I would, absolutely. I mean, some of that came out of the work that we did with, with TLP this summer, um, playing around with a lot of different applications. I, I chose... Um, I chose the ones that I, you know, ultimately, I don't think it's about the actual thing. I don't think it's about Twitter or Ning or Wikispaces because those are going to change. It's going to be something else in six months or a year or whatever. And so when I, even when I hear faculty say, well, I don't want to learn to use those or use those with groups because they'll be gone, I don't think that's the point. I think the point is how do you leverage whatever social media is available to you at the time and think about how you can use it with groups, even knowing it's going to shift. I did pick Twitter because it's so popular right now. And my sense was that students weren't using it and that it might be interesting to see how they approached it. Most of the people I know who Twitter are people in their four, you know, 30s or 40s. In fact, first day of class, one of the students said to me, I'm not going to Twitter. My mom Twitters. I mean, they, they have this real sense that it's a professional space, not for them. And they're, while they were all over the Ning and all over the Wiki space and all over Vista, there's been real resistance to the Twitter side because they aren't quite sure what its purpose is yet or what purpose for them is, and they don't see themselves necessarily as people who need to use it in their professional lives. Um, so I would be open always to thinking about what different Web 2.0 applications, what affordance they have. I like the wiki space um, because it's so easily, you know, you can so easily edit it, but you could do the same thing with Google Docs and Google. I mean, there are just so many out there that you could use. So, um 
Yeah, I chose them. I chose them based on, in some ways, their popularity at this given moment in time, too. Yeah, Laura. Um, I have a a comment and then a question. Okay. Um, first of all, the way you approached your uh, working in groups seems like this when you when you talked about learning, uh -huh. uh, it's a very constructive approach. That's right. Um, do other folks in your department? Do you think they're going to follow along in this model? And the fact that you're using groups so much in the work that the students are, are producing, um, how do you share that with them? How do you get them to see benefits in doing it? Yeah, I think ultimately um, it's a, I mean, I think we're still, a, I mean, I think in any department, but a, particularly in the English very product driven and so when you can show them that the student writing or the student whatever they produce is still high quality or that they don't have to stress about well students won't do as well working together as they would if I was being more didactic you know more lecture like I, I mean I think this <laughs> this campus has a really old school way of in my opinion thinking about knowledge I mean that's why we mostly lecture and test is because we think you know it and you need to demonstrate it. So I would say um, the more we can describe what we do and then show what gets, you know, what comes out of those, what's the, what's the thing they produce out of that, that will help us to imagine. And there's certainly a time and place for a direct lecture on something. That's not to say it's never a good idea, um, but. Well, so to follow up with that uh, assessment. Yes. I mean, the department's probably very concerned and your faculty yes. are very concerned about assessment. Do you think you'll have some models that come out of this class that will demonstrate the high quality that group work is yeah. doing? And I think we have for a while. I think um, if you, we often run essay contests or model student essays. And I'll, I mean, a writing class actually really lends itself beautifully to this way of teaching, right? And more so maybe than disciplines who, who think that there are specific bodies of information they need to get to students. So I realize it's, it's a different way. You know, our discipline is very specific and lends itself to getting feedback on writing, right? But um, I think that certainly the papers that have come out of our class even previously have demonstrated those are the ones that often win. And those are also, also the students who are really excited about going to class because they're so much doing. They're, they're actually doing things and thinking about ideas. You might want to think about, you know, being lectured to for a long time is hard, as I'm doing to you now. <laughs> <laughs> I imagine that you have plans to do um, uh, some kind of feedback from your students at the end of the semester to get their um, take on uh -huh. doing this kind of work. And will you share that and make that available to the rest of the campus? Absolutely. We're going to do um, Steve Metzger, who's also teaching a big jumbo section of a first-year writing course, and I are going to do some survey work with students, and we're going to make and ask them, and specifically do some interviews with them to ask them. Um, it's also always a part of our reflective writing at the end, where they talk about structures of the class and what worked and what didn't. I'm curious to see if in this move towards jumbos or hybrids, you know, how the smaller, if you think about it as a smaller learning community, these groups of students, how that might be a way that we can manage, you know, this having all these bodies in the room that they, they can support each other. Which segues me into the next <laughs> okay. question, which is, this is a face-to-face -face class. Mm -hmm. Have you taught an online course of this nature, and can you see using these kinds of tools maybe happening in an online format? I've taught it as a hybrid, but not completely online, but absolutely, I mean, absolutely. Forming permanent groups on Vista or with these other technologies just makes sense that they would get to know each other through the things they wrote or things they shared about their research. Um, I teach a course called Reading Literature for Future Teachers and it's often taught as one day together, one day online, and they get just as tight in their groups as seeing each other face to face over multiple times like the freshmen are right now. Yeah. I have a question for you. I think other people are going to be interested in knowing. Right, so that they don't start emailing me. <laughs> yeah. um, obviously, the Twitter is public because I've seen them. Yes. And um, so you're not locking down Twitter. Is the name locked down or is it fully public? How did you choose <laughs> What's not, you know, public? And how has the fact that it's public changed the students' 
Right. Yeah, I I hope it changes that. I hope that the fact that some of this is public is the thing I want them to understand is that you're whatever you put out there on the planet, you know, you got to think about before you post it or whatever. They could um, decide. I actually encourage them to make their Twitter accounts private, and that they had to let people join. But of course, not I'm public because it was just easier for them to join with a hundred of them than me approving every one of those. Um, the Ning is private. Um, and the wiki space you can see, but you can't edit unless you're a member of our wiki space. And it is so, I mean, it is so academic, research focused, there's nothing. But the Ning we, we hold as our own. And I approve pictures that go up, videos that go up. Well, I mean, I have that feature on the Ning that I, it needs administrative approval before it goes up. And so far, no one has, I mean, I've said it's still school. I mean, ultimately, please don't post, you know, the ubiquitous red cup pictures. And they haven't. So, so yeah. Did that answer your question? Absolutely. It did. <laughs> and I'll, I'll piggyback on this. Why didn't you choose Facebook? Because I figured that that was something they already knew really well. And, um, and we are reading a bunch of articles about Facebook. We just read this great article by Dana Boyd about friendship and the way friendship is constructed on those sites. And, they loved it, but it was because they are so familiar with MySpace and Facebook. So um, I didn't pick it because I'm – of the hundred of them in there, they all have Facebook. They all have a Facebook account. And I will also say that of the hundred that are in there, all but three have laptops. And so we do have our laptops in the room, in their small groups. They have their laptops in front of them doing all this online work and emailing each other or whatever. So, yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Thanks again, Kim, yeah, for welcome. coming in today and um, working with us here in TLP. We certainly appreciate it. You are so welcome. And before we sign off, we're just going to do a plug for some of the other Please people do. that are coming in yes. uh, in the future. October the 14th, we have Dr. Yanya Lalich, who's going to come and talk about uh, getting student feedback with Blackboard Vista surveys. She does a really nice job of getting um, student opinions about books she uses, her mm. methodology, things of that nature, which is unusual. Yes, that's great. Yeah, yeah. Whoever thought about that, Yeah, right? no kidding. That's okay. cool. Okay. And on October the 28th, we have Assessment Strategies for Vista oh, that's cool. with uh, Roseanne Younger from the uh, Construction Department. And same thing in his case, they've had lots of different um, methodologies for the way they're assessing their students through Vista. And he's got some interesting oh, that's uh, that would be stories. Helpful. Yeah. yeah, hopefully you come. Yeah, so Thanks, everybody, for coming today, and we appreciate it. Thanks again, Jesse, for helping us. Thanks, and Jesse. That's all for today. Okay. Archive recording.